Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you again today. We thank you for all that you've done, and we want to give you glory and honor and praise, and we ask <clears throat> that you would be glorified during this time as we study your word. Father, I pray that we would have a vision of you and of your son, and I pray that you would comfort your people right now as there's just a lot of things going on in the news. There's um, issues with the weather and just there's so many unknowns, Father. I pray that your peace would be with your people, it would be in our hearts, that it would guard us and encourage us now during uh, these trying times. We pray for this COVID crisis to be brought to an end. We also pray that people would do the right thing, whether it's individuals in our neighborhoods or our government officials and leaders. Father, I pray that people would would um, seek to do what's right and what's pleasing in your sight, Father God. Father, we also pray now for your gospel to grow and to increase in the world. I pray that we would do our part. Each one of us have, has a different part to play. I pray that we'd be faithful in all those things. And we ask lastly for your son to return and to bring up an end to all these different uh, suf uh, suffering and, and trials. In Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior, we pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so if we can just uh, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. Let me go ahead and put this up on the screen. What I will do is I'll go ahead and read again from verses 9 to 20, but we'll, can, we'll pick it up in verse number 12. And uh, there's some text here I hope that you can still read as, as I, you can still follow as I read along. You're not too distracted. So the word of the Lord. Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20. And I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and kingdom and patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were like wool, were white like wool like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were, were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining like the sun in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those things that are and those things that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the lampstands, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and let's investigate this incredible uh, vision, continuing the first vision given to John. <clears throat> let's, look at the full, let's look at the full context here, and um, I'll break some of these things out so that we can see them better. And let's just talk through this. There is a parallel passage that I'll give to you that I want to look at eventually. Uh, I'll give it to you now. Daniel chapter 7. We will be looking at Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and the passage that we will be looking at eventually will be Daniel chapter 7, and it will be verse 13 and following. Okay, so you don't have, you can go there now if you want, but we're going to focus right now on this, and eventually we'll get there. So let's look first. I want to look first at Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 16. This uh, this first part, I shouldn't say first part, second part, because 
he's already heard the, vo the, vo the voice. So this is the second part of the vision. So there's a lot of things going on in here. Uh, an incredible vision. So let's just look, look at here and let's just talk through some of these things that you notice and what are some of the possible significances. If you want to cheat and look at Daniel 7, absolutely do that. We'll, we'll, we'll get that in a minute. What are some things, what are some observations, some questions? What about ideas or repetitive ideas from earlier are there is there any repetitive ideas or words from earlier in the passage as well you can look at earlier parts in the passage the voices the voice okay yes okay great so there is, the, there is this voice here And it's speaking to him. Seven. Seven lamps. And the number seven. Okay, great. Okay, I like that. So let me just write this down here first, and then we're going to get to that second observation that I heard, which I really like. Uh, here we go. So he, so he sees... Seven golden lampstands, right? So this is the object. And what really comes out is this idea of seven, right? Where have we seen this seven before? Applied to what? The seven churches? Church and churches. Yeah, great. So there's this is this is also re replied to earlier the seven churches, and this is both in in one four, and then also in one eleven. Right, the, you see it right above there. That to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. So there's already two references. So there's there's seven churches referenced twice. What else, where else do we see the seven? There's another place we've already seen the seven. Seven spirits? Yeah. And where is that, Luigi? What verse? What, is that also one four? I think it's also one four, right? Great. So, no, so notice here, what, what is the type of action? Now, I, I, now maybe you're going to say, Tim, you're kind of just getting redundant. Fair enough. But what is the type of action? What action do you see here in reference to the seven golden lampstands? What are the repetitive words? That we, right? We see this, I see, turning, I saw, right? Write what you see. So what I want us to see is that a, 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 a theme is really this action of seeing throughout the book of Revelation. And especially this is where we get to vision or revelation that we, we discussed, remember, several weeks ago. So we're going to continue to see this theme throughout the book. These are all these vision. These are these visions. And so he's, so he's seen these things. Okay. So what I, what I want to really highlight here is that this is not, this is not a dream. Okay. I want to make that clarification here. Okay. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? It, it, it's he's, he's in, 
he's in this state of 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 seeing things and, the, and so but but he's not he's not dreaming the mean to say he's not asleep okay is everyone tracking there with me and obviously if you continuing on 13 my question is something else that he sees is one like a son of man what is why are they all in lower case like, okay no yeah great great question so let's so let's let's work through verse 13 great question here so the the first thing we see is this comparison here so that's something else he sees right yeah no excellent so so the connection here is is um So this would be object. So this is number one, right? This is number two. So, so he sees two things. He sees seven golden lampstands and he sees one like the son of man. So uh, let's just make, I'm going to make a quick fix here. Let me just, because this is describing Now, with reference, is there a location for where he sees the one who is like a son of man? Is there, I guess, what is the qualification to him seeing this one like the son of man? Maybe, Luigi, you can answer that. Well, well while he's seeing those seven golden lampstands, among them, he can see that son of man. Yeah. So, so we're identifying this as, this is a location. I like your word. You use the word among. Well, it says, yeah, amid, in, in the midst, right? Yeah, and uh, among is the same as in the midst, right? In the midst is in the middle. That, that's an right. older word we don't really use in the midst. It would be in the middle, right? Mm -hmm. But that's quite significant. If, if, if everyone, so, so let's, you know, uh, maybe we can jump the, the gun. Who, who for, from your knowledge, from, from, from other places, or we can wait, but um, who is this one like a son of man? Christ. Yeah. So I think the text is the the context is really going to clearly show that this is Jesus Christ. And we're going to confirm that in a second. Now, if this was the first time and we were unfamiliar with this passage, many of us have already studied this passage many times. If we were unfamiliar, we would not want to make this con con conclusion. But the text is clear. You're already seeing the, the, the words being written in red in your in your scripture. So so identifying as Jesus Christ. Now we have to highlight why is he called like a son of man. Fair enough, but we can identify it as Jesus Christ. And so um, uh, the the context is also going to identify according to the context who are what are the seven what are the seven lampstands according to the context who are these. Hey Tim, can we, sorry, sorry. Can we just go back? I'm still, I'm still kind of confused as to why it's it's described. If, if it's Jesus Christ, why wouldn't they say one like the Son of Man? Yeah, we're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. Oh, okay. Sorry. No. Great. No, that that that's something that I wrestle with as well. And so, no, you're great, um, great obs great observation and question. And we're gonna come back there. So I I want to I want to kind of hold that. Uh, because okay. there's going to be a connection with something. So let's table that question. But ac thanks for pushing, because that's a really important question. Th thanks for getting that clarification there. So um, we, we want to first identify from the context, from subsequent context, what are the seven golden lampstands? These are the churches? Yes. <clears throat> um. So let's hold on the significance right now. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and discuss the significance um, of what the, the lampstand is signifying concerning the church. Let's, let's, make, let's make a hold. Let's put a hold on that. But let's look at this 
let's look at, I want to compare this relationship here. What is a deep, what is a deep theological truth? Looking at these arrows that I just, I just made, what is a profound truth? That, that they're spirits? Um, yeah, so, so you're saying that the seven spirits are also present? Is, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I don't know. No, no, and, and, and um, we, 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 can, we can put that there because I think later that'll become clear that the seven spirits are, are present as well. I mean, I, I read it. I read it like one of the lampstands was like the Son of God, uh, Son of Man. That that that's how I interpreted it. Okay, yeah. So that 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 would not. Yeah, I, I I think especially later in the context, it's going to be clear. The one like the Son of Man is Jesus. Uh, let's go down here. Um, yeah, so the reason why you could not, the reason why you could not say that, and, and I, I understand why you would say that, is because it says in the midst of the lamp stands one like the Son of Man, and then it describes he's clothed with a long robe, with the golden sash, with the hairs. So it would be really hard to make that identification that the one like the Son of Man is, is a spirit of the lamp stand, because, um, I, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but the succeeding context really, and I think you'll see that as, as we look through the passage, that it really has to be this person who's clothed, his hairs are white, like, like wool, he has eyes like a flame of fire. That's really identifying the one like a son of man. Okay, so um, maybe if it's not clear to you right now, I, I, I understand. I think it will be, especially when we look just later on, and then also in, in the book of Daniel. Um, and also in the Gospels, he was known as the Son of Man. By okay, um, yeah. So was it, Mar was it Mark? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, uh, great observation, Amy. Great observation. Let's let's hold that with the question with uh, Luigi. So <laughs> I want us to focus. I want us to put aside like a Son of Man. I want to focus. I want to focus on this relationship here. So there's. Uh, the vision is showing seven golden lampstands and one in the midst of the seven lampstands. And, and we're identifying that one as Jesus Christ. It'll be, it'll be very clear in, in a few minutes. What is so significant about this, this specific uh, location and relationship? W what is so significant here? Let's kind of tease this out. So we've identified the lampstands as churches. the churches. The one is Jesus. And the location is among. So what is so significant here? The church is worshiping Jesus. Yeah. So so the the the, the presence the presence of I, I, maybe it was a it was a hard question the, the presence of Jesus uh, the presence of Jesus in uh, in the churches. And perhaps, perhaps I'm actually thinking about it here. I've really emphasized this in my other my other uh, uh, courses, so maybe I haven't maybe I haven't done it here. I apologize. Um, uh, when we talk about the name Lord, there are three incredible truths about Lord. There's there's dealing with His authority, His power, and then the third component, His presence, divine presence. 
And so we've already from pre our previous study from previous weeks, we've, Id we've identified Jesus as the Lord, right? So Jesus is the Lord according to uh, Revelation, Revelation 1, 8, right? We've identified that. Do you remember that discussion where 1, 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And we, we talked about before how that was not a reference to God the Father, although he is that. That is a, a declaration, a reference to Jesus, to Jesus Christ, okay? And if, and if you're struggling with that or you have a question about that, we have a video on YouTube. You can watch the video and, and, and really see how we unpack that and really see, see how that comes to bear. But what I, what I want to emphasize here is this idea of, of divine presence, okay? And so here we have, even though Jesus, Thus, even though Jesus is at the right hand of God, even though he is in heaven, his presence is among the churches. Okay, great. Cool. All right, Frank. So Frank's observation about the presence of the Spirit, I, 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 even if maybe the, the focus is not here, explicitly, implicitly, that's implied. So that was a good observation. Maybe Frank spoke better than he knew, but it was good. It was really good. I liked it. It was good. Um, but I want us to see this here, that even though Jesus is the Lord God, the one coming in the clouds, right? So so when, when he says he's coming with the clouds, the idea is like, oh, man, Jesus is not really with us right now, right? If he's coming with the clouds, every eye will see him. It's like he's far, but he's going to be returning. So in one sense, he is he is far. He is in heaven. In another sense, though, he is present with his people. This is, he is present with us. In this vision, Jesus is not far, he's present. What type of encouragement is that for us? Is that, is that why the lampstand, lampstands are golden because of his presence? So, so the, the lampstands. <laughs> So, so where where in scripture do we see lampstands, Silvio? I, I'm gonna ask where do we see that from a Hebrew study? Where does the lamp stands? It might have been before I joined, I don't recall, to be honest. Right. So we, we talked about the old covenant, the new covenant. Lampstands are in the temple, right? <laughs> the lampstands are in the temple. And so, and so there's this massive vision that we are, the churches are now in the presence of God in his temple, right? I, the, the, the truth is so profound. And, and even though Jesus is in heaven, he will be coming one day physically. He is present in the temple. So there is this priestly idea here as well right so let's let's look at the let's look at the image here let's look at the image here okay so uh that's the idea of the golden lampstand idea though that, that the golden lampstands were in the temple in the old in, in the in the in the tabernacle and also in the temple in the old testament and so now we the church is that lampstand the churches are the lampstand i mean it's just the the, the truth i mean the vision is so profound, what it's teaching us concerning divine presence, concerning the temple, which is where God lived, right? Uh, he lives with us. Uh, so let's look, now, let's look now at this description. So let's, let's talk through this description here of, of we're kind of setting up now. So uh, what, what are the first, the rest of verse 13 there are several descriptions here. Let's label the description and let's make some, some sign. Let's identify some symbolism and some significance. So we're looking at right now. We're looking at right now the description, and then also this is moving towards symbolism in those in that description. Okay. 
So I want you to identify the specific description for me. Maybe that's easy, but I also want you to consider the, the, the symbolism, okay? And, and, if, and if you're wrong or, or, or we're wrong, it's fine. Because, because even for me, I had to change some of my own perspective. So lucky for me, I can change it as I study. So don't be afraid if like, okay, maybe it's something else. Don't, no fear, okay? There, there should be no fear. Even Jesus says that. Are you, would it be like a long robe with a golden sash, like a king? Okay, yeah, great. So, so, so Frank, let's identify the first one. So Frank identifies this golden sash around his chest. Golden sash around his chest. And so this could signify um, a kingly, uh, kingly, uh, a, 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 king, a kingly uh, clothing. Let me make a check here because I had a different identification, but I want to I want to see if that's within the realm of possibilities for. Okay, yeah. So there's two possibilities here. There's two possibilities. Okay. So in both of these, they could be kingly, or they could be kingly, or like a high rank position. That's possible. So so Frank and identify that's possible. Another possibility is. A priest, this is priestly garments as well. So the long robe with the golden sash are priestly garments, okay? And that actually fits, if, if, we, if this identification is correct, right? This is our identification here. The lampstands are in the temple and this is a temple context, right? Then, then perhaps we want to highlight this priestly garments. So we, we're seeing Jesus being represented as priest. Now that doesn't take away from the kingliness, the high rank. We're going to see that as well, perhaps in this vision. Okay, but I, I think um, uh, we want to highlight the priestly because there's multiple components of of this vision here. So let's, let's go with priestly, but I, I really hear the idea of high rank and kingly and actually that's possible. So if you prefer, like, you know, in my own interpretation, I think the kingly is a better, fair enough. You know, I don't want to, you know, so, so that's, that's really within the realm of interpreters. They're also including that as well. Um, great. So we, we have at least this authority, there's authority here, right? So whether you're a priest Priest speaks to um, mediation, and Kingly speaks to authority, right? Let's go to verse fourteen. What are the two, or what are what are some other significances here? Even verse fifteen, and then. What do you think it's, it symbolizes? What are some other descriptions here? Purity. What was that, Pastor? Purity. Purity. Okay. Okay. Great. So, where do you see that, Pat? Where do you see that? The, 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 like snow, white as snow. Yeah. Excellent. So, what about uh, the white wool to be uh, the Lamb of God? So, no, that's a good observation. Um, that's, a, that, that, that's, a, that's a good observation, Luigi. I think the fact that it's comparing, the comparison is the hairs of the head, right? So the hairs of the head, number one, they're white. And then you have this comparison like wool and then like snow. So I do think that the, because they're trying to give a physical picture of the whiteness of of the of the hair so I, I wouldn't want to make that connection although elsewhere that's for sure present luigi so i, I don't want to minimize that but i do think the illustration is more on the whiteness and so i definitely like this purity idea here um uh so there's this idea of purity what else if, if hairs on someone's head are white what else does that signify that he saw wisdom. 
Seniority. Yes. Wisdom. Uh, um, there is a sense of authority, right? The, the, maybe not so much in, in, in American culture, but correct in other cultures, especially in, in Jewish culture, this signified uh, authority, someone that was, el was a leader, right? It has, and, I, and I think that these three ideas are really true. Purity, wisdom, authority. Now, I, these are, these are, these are, let us hold our, what's the word? Um, let us keep our interpretations loose because we are going to make a connection with another passage. Okay, so we are going to make a, a connection with another passage. So this, let's hold this loose right now. Okay. Uh, uh, I, was, yeah. I was also thinking it shows the, um, like, God of the ages, like the um, antiquity in some ways, like the Christ. I don't know. I guess that the creation, like just that um, the white hair shows age a little bit. Yeah. yeah. No. Excellent observation. That's nice. <laughs> Amy. Oh my goodness. So let's let, let's add that and let's let's hold it until we get to Daniel. So that's really good. I think we have a good idea right now. That's that that's this is good so far. So let's keep moving on because I do want to get to this this thing. So so let's move along. Let's keep that. Let's keep that, and we'll come back. Uh, next, uh, the eyes. The eyes. So, what does this signify? Eyes were like flame of fire. What does this signify here? He's he's coming with vengeance. Okay. So what? Yeah, there is this vengeance idea. Let's just because of the negative connotation of vengeance. Um, okay. Our, what's another word very similar to vengeance? And even vengeance. Judgment. Can't, what, what a quest. Judgment. judgment. I heard judgment. What did What did you say, Frank? Did you Did you say judgment, or was there another word you wanted to use as well? No, that that's good. I like that. Yeah, yeah I like it too. Judgment. Um, something else that is a is a massive theme throughout Scripture is this idea of eyes his eyes. And so throughout scripture, we see God uh, looking, assessing, and judging. So that goes along. So I think the judgment kind of, we were seeing it more with the, the flame of fire, but the eyes of God, uh, King James, the eyes of God run to and fro the whole earth, right? Uh, in, in, in creation, God sees the creation. It is good. God comes in Genesis 3 and, and he judges. He sees the sin of man and he place, places judgment on them. Uh, you don't have to go there, but let me go to... Let me go and to... Also, isn't it Corinthians that say that every work we did would go through fire? Yes, yes. And no, so... Yeah. The judgment of God would be. Yeah, so this flame of fire is really accenting uh, judgment, uh, or we could also say uh, punishment. Punishment and thus reward, right? And so we see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 3. You say purification too? Yeah, so so fire does purify. It does purify. It can purify. Um, uh, I would say that the comparison with the eyes and the fire is more just in a judgment context, if, if that makes sense. Because it's the eye. It's the eyes that are then the ones that are going to bring the. So if, if everyone makes the sense, the judge has to see right has to see and, and make the judgment. Um, let me let me go to several passages and then so you can, we won't turn there. Let me just read it to you for, for sake of time. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. 
And this, this idea here being that, that God sees everything and he will judge everything. Now that's more implicit, not explicit. But look at look now. So let's make a, a, par a parallel with with Ecclesiastes 12. So that's Old Testament Ecclesiastes 12, 13, 14. If you want to write that down, uh, Hebrews chapter four, Hebrews chapter four, verses twelve and thirteen. Now, typically, this is used in reference to the physical word of God, and. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read 12 and 13 as one unit and looking at how we, our context, looking at the context of Ecclesiastes 12, I'm convinced of this. How do we define the word of God? So Hebrews 12, Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. For the word of God is living and active. So the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We saw, we saw a two-edged sword somewhere. Uh, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discern. Now watch. So that's the, the, the we always will say the word of God. Oh, that's the that's just the Bible. Okay. But listen to this. So it's active and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Okay, yeah, that's that's just the Bible. Okay, but watch. Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. <laughs> The word of God is, it's almost like it's a person, right? That's seeing. Uh, watch verse 13. And no creature is hidden from his sight. <laughs> the word of God is not the word. It is, but it's, it's, it's a person. No creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So, it, so let's write this down here. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. And Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. And, and this word of God, of course, there is a sense because it's all coming from God. So I'm not saying either or. So there is for sure a sense in which the word of God is referring to God's physical word as being quick and powerful and sharp. Um, but in, in, in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, <clears throat> there's like a transformation in the text where the word of God is now actually seeing and judging. And so if you were to say, Tim, how do you define the word of God? Primarily, it's Jesus. <laughs> Because he is the living word, right? The word of God was in the beginning, right? So we're not, I'm not putting, I'm not pitting word of God as in the scripture against Jesus. It's one and the same, okay? I'm not, but I, but the accent is upon the living word, okay? And so here, what we see here is this idea of the eyes are like a flaming fire. No creature is hidden from his sight. So there is this and, and, and what I'm trying to get at is Hebrews, Hebrews 4 and Ecclesiastes 12. The eyes are primarily in this, in this judgment context. So is everyone, I, I, I said a lot. Let me take a pause if you want to ask a question. Is everyone tracking with what I'm saying here? Everyone's seeing that there. So what I, just to repeat, when we see the eyes especially the eyes of God, we should be thinking judgment, judgment, and the judgment is both positive and negative. So we typically think judgment negative, but it's also positive. It's also positive. God will judge and he will reward or punish. And throughout scripture, God will reward the faithfulness of his saints. And that's true. So we should not just look at this in a negative context. We should look at in the idea, and I, that's why I like Pastor Pastor Henry, uh, Pastor uh, Noel bringing up the Corinthians three. There's a reward, and there's there could also be a, a punishment there. It, it, it's positive and negative. Okay, everyone's tracking with me. Feet like burnished bronze. What, what does this signify to us? Uh, I'll just give. I'll just give. Um, uh, 
uh, what there's different debates here. What, what many people will say is that this suggests uh, a moral purity and strength, but also judgment, and God is known as a consuming fire. So I, I do think that this is kind of coming along more with a judgment theme as well, that he is swift to bring about, he's swift and strong to bring about his judgment. Okay. Um, maybe you want to push back on that. Maybe you agree, but there is this judgment idea and uh, there is strength in bringing this about. There's also acting in bringing this about the judge in our physical, the judge not only has to have the authority to, to, to give the punishment or the reward, but he also has to have the ability, right? So a judge that has no power, he can bang, right? So the, the biggest, we're all Americans here. So I don't really say this in the Philippines, but we can say it here, right? Um, so like a judge in a court has strong power, right? The judge, let's say when it's in Congress, Congress is more limited in what they can do. They can bang, they can, they can say you are, you are, you know, but right now there it's everything's so partisan. It's so partisan that there isn't really a lot of actual raw power in Congress. They can say you're in contempt of court Pe on both sides. People aren't really afraid of, of, of that type of, of there, there's no power behind the, the gavel being hit, right? So anyone who's watching politics sees that, right? Whether I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm not making assessment. I'm just saying, I'm just making the observation that, you know, that would be a context in which there isn't really a lot of power behind the banging of the gavel, right? Um, but in a, in a courtroom, in a criminal courtroom, there is that power, right? There is very strong power. And so there is that swift action. So that's what I think is being conveyed here at the feet of burnished bronze refined in a furnace, that there is this backing to uh, the, the judgment motif, okay? Um, then we have next here, the voice of the roar of many waters. So uh, what does this convey in your idea? For those of you who, what, what does this idea convey here? War of many waters. It's like unstoppable. unstoppable. So yeah, un unstoppable. Um, it conveys power. Power. What else? What's another idea? The roar of many waters. What's another? What's what comes to your mind? Like a waterfalls. <laughs> yeah, it's so loud, right? It's so loud. It's almost like when you're at the waterfall. Pastor Noah, have you been to, to Niagara Falls? Yeah. I haven't been, but it's so loud, right? Can you talk when you're right next to the fall? Or is it hard when you're below at the bottom? Oh, no, I have been under the, the it's, not, it's not Niagara Falls, but the, the Hinulugan, Hinulugan Tak Tak. In, in Laguna, yeah, I went under the falls. It was so loud you could barely hear anything. You cannot talk, right? It just uh, you, yeah. You cannot hear what somebody saw. You cannot he, you cannot hear them. Just the water, the gushing of water is what you yeah. hear. Yeah, and I like what you're saying. Unstoppable power, and it's just loud. It just the power is so strong. It just it literally. No other sound matters, right? It just drowns everything out. It's so powerful. And that's his voice. We've already heard the voice, right? It's a loud voice. And, and we, we can make this identification here. Word of God here. Word of, uh, word of God. This is, and this is Jesus, right? So this is part of the big picture, but the voice also is quite significant. Then we have this, this is more of, this is, this is a, a description. So where are we at here? So this is one, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then look at the number seven. In his right hand, he held seven stars. So again, this, this signifies, because we're running out of time, uh, we could say here, uh, sovereignty. Power. Control. 
in the vision, right? The fact that he's holding seven stars is insane, right? I mean, that like that's like pure power, right? Um, and and the seven is is this image again of 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 this number seven that's being used, okay? Two more things of this image, this image, and we'll end we'll end it here. Two more things. Everyone, look at this. From his mouth came out a sharp two-edged sword. <laughs> Where is the power? Where is the power coming from? His mouth. His mouth. What's another word we can use for his mouth? From scripture. What comes from the mouth of, of Jesus? Word. Word. Again, coming back to this idea of word of God. And we sing the song, there's power in the word. <laughs> All right, we sing that. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, let's ask the question. In the scripture, looking at the past actions of God, where is the example of the greatest power in his mouth, in his word, in scripture, in the past? Where creation. is creation? By the word of his mouth, all things exist, right? <laughs> so, I hope everyone sees this here, this vision, this vision, the, the, the power of this one like the son of man is in his mouth. Out of it is coming the sharp two-edged sword. So what, what is this vision saying? What, what should we be, and, and that, let's just do the last one. The last one is his face is shining like the sun in full strength. So this is uh, light insane light does not god dwell in an approachable light yeah. and now you have one like a son of man whose face is shining like the sun in full strength i think that means uh no one can really look at the face of jesus face to face you will be consumed by his uh <laughs> i mean so, no, that's excellent. So watch this. Watch. Let me just drop this down here. When I saw him, when I saw him, I fell to his feet. And this is the description. As dead. This is pure fear right here, pure fear. This is the reaction to the vision. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Now, we're going to go to Daniel and then be done tonight. We'll continue this next, next time. If we choose to do Wednesday night, we can have a vote. But I want to ask the question, looking at this vision, looking at what's being described here, what, what is your asset? Who, let's ask the question now. I, I wanted to wait for, for Luigi's question. Uh, who is the one like a son of man. What would you be tempted to, to, to say this person is? We identify it as Jesus, but looking at this vision here, this description, who else might we be tempted to identify it, it as? The, the text has not stated Jesus yet, right? Who, who would we be tempted to, to identify this as? The all-powerful God. Yes. I hope everyone sees that. The all-powerful God, the, the, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire, the one whose head is white like wool, 
the one who has a voice like the roar of many waters, whose mouth is a sharp two-edged sword. We would say, that's God the Father, the, all, the creator of the universe, right? Let's go quickly because there's a parallel. There's a parallel here. And, 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 I, and, and so this is part of our conclusion. We're going to finish out this picture tonight. Um, but I want us to first go to, uh, let's go in our Bible to Daniel chapter 7. And we'll close it on this. Daniel chapter 7. Just bear with me as I load. Here we go. Daniel chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. So there's a vision. You can look at the vision another another time. Um, uh, this is there's there's a first part of this vision. We're not we can't read the whole vision, so I would encourage you to read the whole vision. I'm just going to read the part of the vision that that is analogous. That is there is a fulfillment. There is analogous, and there's also fulfill, a fulfillment component to Daniel's vision here. So look at this. As I so let me just highlight here. As I looked, right, so, so Daniel's seeing a vision very similar to John. So we're really seeing this comparison here. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. So this here, without going into all the different interpretation, this is being identified as the Lord, okay? The Lord God. Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hairs on his head were like pure wool. <laughs> wow, where did, we, where did we see that before? So our initial conclusion in Revelation 1 seems to be spot on, and this is the Lord God. He has clothing that, maybe the clothing is a little bit different, but the, the hair is dead on. Uh, his, his head was like pure wool. His throne was uh, fiery flames. So that's similar, but a little bit different. Uh, its wheels were like burning fire. Right? So there's, there's, there's this fire, burning fire stream issued and came out before him, and thousands and thousands served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment. So this is really our judgment motif that we were highlighting. There, there is a huge comparison similarity here, a slight difference, but there is a, a massive comparison here. Does everyone see that? I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. So the horn is against the Ancient of Days. He's against him. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body was destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. So the fire is judgment. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season of time. I saw in the night visions and behold, clouds of heaven. There came like, there came one One, like a son of man. So, this is going back to Luigi's question, okay? Why is it like a son of man in Revelation, okay? There is massive debate whether it should be, it should be uh, the son of man or a son of man. Meaning to say that this is, this is uh, comparing to uh, mankind, that is humanity. And this speaking to a title. Does everyone see that? The son of man is a title, the son of God, a title, right? like a son of man, referring to the humanity. Does everyone see that? Luigi, are you tracking with me there? Jesus is both one like the son of man. He is a son of man, and he has the title son of man. So uh, maybe for, for next week, we can discuss this title son of man if you want. That would be another aside study. 
but my perspective, if you were to say, how do I answer the question, Luigi? Like a son of man in Revelation is literally picking up on this, on this right here. So it's, it's say, saying it in the same way. It's making a, a connection between the two. So that's why it's like a son of man. In the original context, in, in the Old Testament context, we need to see that, that there is, the fulfillment is a man. It, the, the, the fulfillment to, to, this, to this kingdom of God is a man. It is humanity, right? So we don't want to remove this idea of like a son of man because Jesus is man himself, okay? The humanity of Jesus. At the same time, Jesus is God himself, the son of God. So what I want us to see here is that it's a little bit vague. It's a little bit unclear because it's morphing the two. Jesus is both God and man. He is both like the son of man. He is both a man and he is God. And in Revelation 9 to 20, we see the divine and the humanity brought into one. So let's finish this, this reading here, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the conclusion. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. To him was given a dominion and, king, and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So in Daniel, the Ancient of Days gives to the, to the Davidic seed this eternal kingdom. All right? In Revelation, we see that the, the Davidic seed is actuality God himself. <laughs> so, so coming back here. So what I want us to see here, everyone, is that this vision here is, 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 is showing the full, the, the divine and human element, uh, the divine nature, the human, the, 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 the human nature of Jesus, 100% of each being brought into one, Okay. And he's fulfilling the Davidic promises. He's fulfilling the Abrahamic promises. He's fulfilling the promise seed of Genesis 3 to undo death itself. We'll pick this up next time. But look at this. Fear not, I am the first and the last, a reference to God. The living one, a reference to man. I died and am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. So, so... Jesus is not only God himself, but he is also fulfilling the promises to David. He is fulfilling the promises to Abraham. He is fulfilling the promises to Adam and Eve. Because in fact, these, these different promises are just further revelation, clarifying that fundamental gospel message that there is a seed, an offspring that will undo the curse of death. Mm -hmm. All right, and so we're seeing the fulfillment of that in the person of Jesus. And he is, he is, there's so many places we can go here. He is with the voice, with the mouth. Uh, he is prophet. Remember, a prophet is just the mouthpiece of God. A prophet is just a mouthpiece of God. So, he is the prophet. This is the word of God. He is the priest. The king is the judge. He is the king. So, and 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 on all of these speak to uh, both divine and human. Human, human nature of Jesus. That's what this vision is revealing for us. 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. This vision is showing us who Jesus is in his fullness. The eternal ancient of days. He is God himself. The Lord God. But he is also fulfilling the Davidic, the Davidic promise, the Abrahamic promise, and also the promise to Adam and Eve. And in the Davidic promise, he was priest, king, and prophet. Priest, king, and prophet. One of these components being brought out here in this vision of the exalted risen lord I'll, I'll end on this here and we're done i apologize for going so late i'm sorry um I hope that we see this. And this is preparing for what is to come. So I want us to see that this is the vision of who Jesus is, the exalted risen Lord, God himself, man himself. And, and he is going to be functioning primarily in this uh, judicial sense, but not at the exclusion of his presence, not at the exclusion of his support for us. So there's multiple ideas here that's going on. I'll turn it over. It's late. I apologize for going over.